Hello everyone and welcome once again to Killer Shrew Fans 12 Days of Reviews. It feels like every year we get a T-Rex or two sneaking their way into the lineup. Last year it was PNSO's Royal Family of Rexes, the year before that it was Rebor's Grab and Go Offerings, and the year before that, Batat's Three Kings. It probably doesn't help that not a year goes by where some company or other doesn't produce a notable figure of the most famous dinosaur of all time, and this year sees offerings from the likes of both Rebor's and Beasts of the Mesozoic, while Eofauna has already confirmed a 2023 release. I guess I know what I'll be reviewing a year from now. Of course, everyone's familiar with Beasts of the Mesozoic, and as such, we all knew the line would be delivering some slam dunk figures of the Tyrant Lizard King. But I don't think any of us expected the same from the likes of Rebor. And I don't know that I have ever seen so much buzz or celebration around one of their releases, and for good reason. Rebor focusing their unique design sensibilities and sculpting talents on creating accurate figures was an absolute breath of fresh air. And one of them even had lips! Correct me if I'm wrong, but I do think the aptly named Kiss is the first available mass-produced Tyrannosaurus Rex model to sport extra oral tissue. And from the awesome bros at Rebor, Rebor no less. And it gets better, they played to both sides of the crowd with the equally fittingly named Tusk, a lipless variant for anyone out there who wants an updated bulky Rex but still prefers a grinning therapy. Theropod. Of course, me being me, with the little self-control that I possess, I picked up both and I'm super excited to finally be talking about them. And since it's already Christmas Eve, I'd say it's high time we get around to a Rex review. So let's get right into it. So the first thing I have to comment on here is the overall bulk of these figures. The thick neck, deep barrel chest, and wide gut on account of the gastralia all come together to give this thing an incredible sense of girth, both from a lateral and dorsal view. You can see it here next to PNSO's Wilson and just how much wider Rebors is in comparison. All of this extra bulk makes the already tiny arms look even smaller, which is a good thing. That being said, they're still well muscled, and the fingers even feature differing lengths, which is a nice detail. The legs are also quite robust, with bulging cords of muscle and flexing tendons in the thunder thighs, calves, and sturdy ankles of the figure, all working to bear the massive weight. The toes are spread wide as they distribute the load, and you can see the backs are adorned with subtle tarsal scoots and smaller reticulate scales, giving the foot a very ratite appearance. And speaking of the details, the model also sports some substantially improved integument and soft tissue sculpt work from Rebor. Tiny scales cover the sculpt head to toe, creating a chainmail-like appearance and texture atop the various folds and tension lines of skin forming with the curve of the neck and the rotation and bracing of the limbs.
The hide is also carved out with various wrinkles and striations, and the weight of the flesh is well captured through the areas of hanging skin folds in the throat, above the pecs, and around the swell of the gut there. Now, some might argue that the scale detail is still too prominent based on the skin impressions we have for T-Rex, and yeah, I don't think you'd be out of bounds for saying so, but I think it's passable enough, especially at this larger scale, to not get bent out of shape over. And that becomes especially true when this is observed from a distance. The pose is one of confidence and power, being rendered mid-stride with the right leg bracing to lift off while the massive tail sweeps back for balance. Meanwhile, the head is held up and turned slightly to the right. As you can see, they balance okay on their own, but you do get an added transparent rod for some extra support, which I do recommend to prevent warping over time, a common issue with Rebor's front-heavy figures. Or you can kick your display up a notch and pair them with Rebor's Diorama bases released just this year. And is that not one dope looking setup or what? Everything about this figure, the pose, size, bulk, and detail make for an imposing and believable model that commands attention from the shelves. The overall presentation is one that reminds me of the T-Rex statues by Blue Rhino Studios, packing all of the details and presence of those incredible works of art into a more manageable package. KISS even features a paint job that feels like a direct play on one of Blue Rhino Studios' color schemes, but sadly, we did not get a faithful recreation of Sue's paint job. If you've followed my channel for a while now, you've probably seen that statue featured in a few videos, and you know I absolutely love it. But I can understand why Rebor opted for this design, as Sue's might have been a bit too plain Jane for some. But of course, we still have one important area of the sculpt left to talk about, that of course being the business end of these Rexes, and I think it's safe to say that I saved the best feature for last. This is one awesome Tyrannosaurus Rex head sculpt, with virtually no sign of shrink wrapping and completed with gorgeous and varied scale details. Smaller scales run across the fenestra and mandible, with crops of larger ornamental scales adorning the angular and surangular region. The nasal is covered with cornified plate scales, while the lacrimals are adorned with a generous buildup of keratin that also runs down and frames the orbits. And speaking on the orbits, you can see how the flared skull of T-Rex has been captured here in a dorsal view, and how that outward angularity pushes the eyes forward into that stereoscopic vision. The eyes themselves appear relatively small in the fleshed out skull, and are finished in a striking gold with pinprick pupils. The only difference between the head sculpts are additional vertical oval shaped scales that run along the oral margin and form the immobile extraoral tissue on Kiss while Tusk's teeth are left exposed. Of course, lips on dinosaurs is no new concept and used to be the norm, but once the pendulum swung in favor of the lipless look, many a brutal and long arguments from internet paleontologists and armchair experts have been fought over which is correct and or quote unquote cooler. There's really nothing I can add to this discourse, as anything I say would just be a tired rehashing of what those more knowledgeable than me have said in the past. Suffice it to say that I think both camps offer interesting arguments and points of view that are worth looking into. If you're interested, I highly recommend Mark P. Witten's various blog posts on the topic, as they offer an expansive yet digestible overview for those like me who need to be spoon-fed this heavy stuff. Stuff. I'll admit that when I first got back into this hobby, I was in the lipless camp, but as I've read more and more on the topic, I've found my outlook has shifted and now I am in the pro-lip camp. That being said, given the amount of discussion surrounding the topic and how much we still have yet to learn, I don't think there's anything wrong with a lipless model, and until anything more concrete is published on, I'll have no compunctions about still going in for a grinning theropod.
The jaws do articulate on these figures, although this unfortunately leads to a few of the biggest issues with the piece, as both of them seem to feature poor jaw construction in one way or another. For Kiss, you can see how the jaw does not close flush, and as such, the teeth are still peeking through the oral margin there in a perpetual sneer. This is kind of a disappointment. The whole point of the extra oral tissue is to conceal the teeth, and I wanted a figure that finally had this feature that I could display with the mouth closed, but the fact that the jaw sags without prompt does detract from that function. I've opted to just not play with the articulation on the jaw just in case that gets worse from use, so you'll have to excuse me for not opening the mouth for you now. Meanwhile, Tusk's jaw articulation feels severely limited. It's the opposite problem. Anytime I open the jaw to what should be its full extent, it just floats back to a nearly closed position. I mean, it's the opposite issue. I wouldn't mind having this one's jaw open and roaring since I'm not trying to showcase the lips that it doesn't have, but it doesn't seem like that's gonna work here either. And no, it's not just mine. Both of these issues seem commonly reported enough, so I'm led to believe that there's something wrong with the construction of the jaw. Maybe you'll get lucky and yours will work perfectly, but unfortunately, I got the short end of the stick. Regardless, holding Tusk's mouth open reveals a look at the arched pink tongue, glossy pseudo cheeks, and the teeth cast in the semi-translucent enamel plastic that Rebor is fond of using and I am fond of getting. The jaw isn't the only point of articulation on this figure. Supposedly the arms can be rotated, although I haven't been able to budge mine myself and don't want to force them for fear of splitting the thin plastic. Again, you may have better luck in this department. The tail is also made of a pliable plastic around a wire, allowing you to choose its positioning. I myself try to limit the amount I bend these for fear of cracking either the material or the paint, so once again you'll have to forgive me if I don't demonstrate that for you here. Unfortunately, the bendable tail does lead to a rather apparent interruption to the sculpt in the form of a notable gap at the connection point. Again, this is something a lot of people have reported on their figures, most notably on Kiss, and I will say that for whatever reason, Tusk seems to fare a little better. It's not enough to kill the overall impression and can even be hidden from view depending on your display, but I know there are plenty of collectors out there where such a notable seam is a deal breaker. And we have admittedly seen better efforts on this front from Rebor in the past. I don't know, maybe the subtle detail work is part of what makes it so noticeable here, but I'm sure there's work you can do to assuage this issue, if you're up for a little DIY. As far as the paint job goes, both sport very strong color schemes. Like I mentioned earlier, Kiss's colors seem to be based on the Blue Rhino Studio statue, and that mix of blacks and reds gives it a very threatening look, almost like a Gila monster. I love the splash of blood red across the lacrimals, and the yellow dusty water really brings out all of that scale detail in such a believable way. The main body then is a dull red with dark stripes. I will say I like the color scheme, but it does suffer somewhat from onesie syndrome with the black feet, hands, head, and tip of the tail poking out of the otherwise red body. And the sudden switch from black to lighter stripes along the tail is a bit jarring. Still, it's a unique design and one that I can appreciate having on my shelves. Meanwhile, Tusk's paint job is a bit more straightforward and an obvious homage to the King Rex, one of Rebor's more infamous early works, sporting various shades of rusty oranges and brown modeling against a cream underbelly, as well as dark dry brushing across the face. The lighter color also helps in making the details more instantly readable. Overall, I think both are quite good, although you may find that you prefer the more straightforward look of Tusk or the intimidating colors of Kiss. All of that said, I do find it odd that, despite Rebor's propensity for repaints in recent times, there's only one variant of each sculpt here. It might have been nice to see Tusk's colors on Kiss and vice versa, and like I said earlier, a Sioux variant would have just been 
Mwah, chef's kiss. That said, a handful of Rebor's projected repaints never come to be, so at least we're spared the disappointment of being teased with paint jobs we'll never get. And this style of one and done feels more in line with their early years of making models. As far as the size of these figures go, they're absolutely huge, measuring just over 16 inches or around 42 centimeters long in a straight measurement and roughly 5.5 inches or 14 centimeters tall to the top of the neck. Using the upper estimates of around 41 feet long, that would put these figures in the 130 scale, with a 48 foot specimen needed to represent Rebor's advertised 135 scale. It's worth mentioning that there was a recent study by Mallon and Hone that talked about the possibility of T-Rex being 70% larger than the fossils suggest, but this is purely speculation and focuses more on the weight of the animal. That said, for believers, a 48-foot rex may not be too implausible, but for me, it's a literal stretch. Now for some size comparisons, and I thought it would be fun to look at T-Rex through the ages. First up here we have Rebor's Mesozoic Rhapsody from last year, of course inspired by the old paintings of Charles R. Knight. And as you can see, that guy was putting lips on his rex before it was cool. Next up we have Nanmu's Alpha Tyrannosaurus Rex, a wonderful interpretation of the Jurassic design, and it's great to see two such glorious models from both sides of the dinosaur spectrum. Of course, this is probably the big catalyst for the sudden resurgence in lipless depictions, but I'll bet that Kiss would admire Rexy's chompers, and Rexy would compliment Kiss's luscious lips. Because kings support kings. Then we have the original Batat Rex, still a gold standard representation after all these years, and remarkable for how well it did Tyrannosaur integument even in the 90s. And speaking of gold standards, we have the Carnegie Tyrannosaurus Rex, another unsung hero in the Sea of Rex figures despite its tripod stance. And then we have Safari LTD's Feathered T-Rex, still one of their best, despite its overplumed appearance. And this makes for an apt comparison because, like Lips, the whole feather idea was championed by many at the time and now seems less in vogue. It's always interesting to see what ideas have come and gone in paleontology and what will stick, but it is ironic that Safari's Rex featured a full coat, but no extra oral tissue. And finally, we arrive at Wilson, the first in the new wave of Rex models for a new age. Although another milestone in model form, it wasn't without its detractors, most notably in its overstated texture and dangling exposed teeth. And whereas I'm happy to say that the integument and bulk are much improved on Rebor's new figure, and the inclusion of lips does bolster its overall look in my eyes, I still think Wilson is worth being celebrated as the turning point it represents. Wilson walked so that Kiss and Tusk could run. Of course, many of Wilson's flaws were addressed in the subsequent Andrea who came out before Rebor's offerings, but I do not have her available for comparison at the moment. What I love about having all of these different Rex figures is how you can display them together to create a timeline that represents our evolving understanding of the Tyrant Lizard King, a parade of T-Rex through the ages, if you will. It's by no means complete here. I still need Rebor's Californication for one thing. Man, they really need to get that Primal Rage one out, but we'll see if that ever happens. Now let's do some other comparisons. First up, here are Rebor's Rexes with Logan, PNSO's <coughs> Nano Tyrannus, and I will say he looks great alongside these full-grown Rexes here. And of course, we need some non-Tyrannosaur contemporaries. So here it is with the recently reviewed Ancestors Edmontosaurus, and that massive 135 scale figure even manages to hold its own against a 130 scale Rex, as you can see. And what would a T-Rex video be without a comparison with its arch nemesis, a Triceratops? Here is PNSO's Doyle, and I think Doyle's gonna need some backup if he's gonna take on these massive Rexes. 
I do find it funny how, like the T-Rex here, Triceratops is seeing its own shift in how we reconstruct the mouth area, only it seems to be going in the opposite direction with less tissue added as opposed to more. And just for the heck of it, here it is with Rebor's recent Carnotaurus Rex. As you can see, these two are similar in size and length if that gives you any idea of how massive these figures are. It also helps highlight what an absolute winning streak Rebor has been on over the past couple of years. These are two of their best yet, in my humblest of opinions. And while we're back on Rebor comparisons, here it is with Rebor's Tenontosaurus corpse or Serenian hind, which makes for a great prey accessory as a general carcass, and makes me wish even more for a Sioux variant. And speaking of corpses, here it is with Rebor's Fallen Queen, the perfect companion piece for these Rexes. You could even use Kiss or Tusk in place of the, um, homely King Rex and bring in King Trident to complete the look. There it is, a diorama like eight years in the making, and this looks like a fight for the ages. And I will close with a comparison to the King T-Rex, and if this doesn't show how far Rebor has come as a company, I don't know what else will. And that was Rebor's new for 2022 Tyrannosaurus Rex models, Kiss and Tusk. Overall, these are a shining achievement from a company already on a hot winning streak. Even with their few notable flaws, I still think these are a new high water mark from them, and two of the most awesome Rex models that money can buy. And the fact that they came from Rebor makes them all the more noteworthy in my eyes. I highly recommend picking them up, even amidst a sea of competition. If not for the artistic merit, then at least for the novelty and to show Rebor that yes, we do want this sort of product from them. At least we're seeing the trend continue for the time being with their upcoming Dinosuchus and Diplodocus, both of which I am eagerly awaiting. As for what else is in store from Rebor, if it's half as good as these tyrants, I don't doubt that I'll be bowing down to it as well. But as always, I want to know what you guys think of these Rexes. Do you own either of them yet? Are you planning to pick one up? Which is your favorite and why? And where do you stand on the whole lip v lipless debate? Leave all of your thoughts in the comment section below. And as always, thank you so much for tuning in to today's review. I hope you all enjoyed it. And I hope to see you all again tomorrow, Christmas Day, for the final episode of Killer Shrew Fans 12 Days of Reviews. And we're going to be going out with a bang. Until then, take care out there, and bye bye